video was from our superintendent, Dr. McClain, but are we ready? Oh, okay, here we go. We are experiencing some technical difficulties, so organizational development and administration of schools. Unparalleled levels of student achievement and school improvement distinguished Dr. Dickey's 20-year career as an educational leader. A native of Texas City, Texas, Dr. Dickey is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, Loyola University, Maryland, and George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where he earned a doctorate in educational leadership and policy and wrote a groundbreaking dissertation on resilience in African American males. He also has many, many other publications, but at this time, to save time for the great word that he's going to bring us this afternoon on curriculum and instruction, please give a round of applause to Dr. Dickey. Good afternoon, everybody. Y'all doing okay? All right. So I'm going to ask you a quick question, then we'll jump into the content. And somebody's going to tell me how much time we have so I don't lose time. Have you ever been to a professional development workshop and a few minutes in, you wanted to grab any sharp object you could find and do yourself harm? At least you would get out of the room, even if you had to get out in an ambulance, right? So this is not one of those opportunities. I don't want to waste your time. So professional development is supposed to be professional and you're supposed to get developed. And so that's what this is an opportunity to do. So I've, I've been a third grade teacher, high school English teacher, um, assistant principal, principal, regional superintendent, chief academic officer, chief of schools, but I never took my eyes off of what it meant to be a third grade teacher in the housing projects of Baltimore. That's where I learned how to close the gap. And so no matter what job I had in public education, I always kept that third grade classroom in mind. And we've been able to replicate significant gains for individual schools, clusters of schools, which is why you're superintendent. Uh, thank you, John, for inviting me here to be with you all today. And hopefully I'll get to see you out, you guys, on a regular basis. So one disclaimer, and then I'll jump to the content. I want to tell you about my presentation style. My presentation style is a bit uh, Pentecostal. Y'all know what I'm saying? So I'm going to start out Methodist, real calm. Right? I may even get a little Catholic and call on Mary a couple of times. But by the time I'm at the end of it, it's going to be fire and baptism. All right? Y'all ready? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So, my question to you. I'm working on my 36th book. I just, I'm the author of Scholastic Literacy International, the textbook series, kindergarten through sixth grade, that teachers pick up and teach kids how to read. 
And I took that from my experience as a third grade teacher. I had nothing, I had broken pieces. They gave me nothing to teach my kids how to read. And so I had to figure it out. And so in that resource is, I'm coming from that resource in my head. And I'm coming from my classroom experience of working with even high performing kids who could do better. So this is not about bubble kids. This is not about low performing. This is about the rising tide of instruction lifting every boat. This is about your proficient becoming more proficient. This is about your gifted who are advanced becoming more advanced. So I'm just going to show you what I did as a third grade teacher all the way up to where I am now working in 38 states to help you as professionals help kids. All right, that's what this is about. So you have a note packet, and I'm going to, I'm going to get to that in a second, but let me lay the foundation first. All right, that's me, y'all. Y'all can see I've been wearing suits a long time. And I know you think this is a tight suit, but it's not. It's slim fit, all right? Okay. Now. I came from a tough situation as a kid, but I had access to instruction that looked like this. This is not in your notes, so let me talk you through it real fast. I had access to a balance of informational and literary text. Now what does that mean? You've heard that before, right? That's one of the international shifts for instruction. But what it really means is on the informational side, kids need access to texts that are historical. Talk about the ELA block. That are historical. That are scientific that are technical in nature, that cross eras, that cross topics, that cross perspectives. Which means what? You have to go look for that kind of stuff. You actually shouldn't be on Teachers Pay Teachers looking for stuff. Right? You should be in a place where that stuff is provided because there's so many, so many things that you have to put in front of kids to make sure that they become illiterate. So how are you going to constantly remember? Historic, scientific, technical errors, topics, perspectives that I expose them to all. And on the literary side, inside of this balance of information on literary text, the amateur will say just give them stories. But it's not just stories. It is three genres of literature, stories, poems, and plays, written by a variety of authors on a variety of traditions of literature. There are 13 traditions of literature. And so this does not happen on its own volition, but it happens through careful selection of the right resources to make sure that you have exactly what you need to do your job well. Are y'all with me? You shouldn't have to look for stuff. And people will tell you, well, I have what you need. It's aligned to the state standards. Have you ever heard that? I have exactly what you need. It's aligned to the standards. That word aligned is code for something. The word aligned is code for they are aligned. Y'all see good times? Anybody remember see good times? Some of y'all look 12. You didn't see it. I ain't talking to you. You, you, you. So we're going to tell you what good times is. Okay? All right. So there was this guy named Lenny. And I'm going to get to this in a second. I've got to lay the foundation. Because I'm going to show you that just there's four things you can do that are high impact that are going to change student outcomes. Because 50% of your kids aren't getting to the proficiency finish line. So what are you going to do about it? How long are you going to admire that problem? I'm going to show you how to fix it. So this guy from Good Times would come in. He, and the, the Evans family was the name of the major family on Good Times. And this guy named Lenny, he would come around every now and then he'd say, Hey, my name is Lenny and I got plenty. And he would open up his jacket pocket and inside of his jacket pocket he would have golden toothbrushes. And he would tell people in the housing projects, I got exactly what you need. But if you live in a housing project, you don't need a golden toothbrush. Need a better job, you need better health care. So I'm going to help you deal with people who are telling you that they got exactly what you need, but it's not aligned to those shifts. Are you with me? So I'm not letting you fool you anymore. And some of that stuff you're downloading from Teachers Pay Teachers is not going to help you to get children to the proficiency finish line. Now, kids need access to authentic texts. And what does that mean? You've heard this before. Authentic, complex text. But some of your kids don't read on grade level. Is that right? Do you serve any kids who don't read on grade level? Are y'all a real church? Okay, talk to me. So, now, how, so this, the expectation is, the shift is, is that children are being exposed to increasingly complex text as the year progresses. But if they don't read on grade level, what do you do about it? Because if they don't have access to complex text, guess what else they don't have access to? Complex ideas. Which enlarges, your, which enlarges your achievement gap when they don't have access to ideas that are more significant, ideas that are more complex because they're locked outside of opportunities to read complex texts. Y'all with me? I'm going to show you how to fix this. Number three, 
text-dependent inquiry. 95% of the questions that kids are going to have to respond to, and I don't really, I want you to think that I'm test prep, because I'm not test prep. Test prep is the enemy. It is the devil. <laughs> Chupacabra. Beelzebub. Satan. That's test prep. Why? Because it's the enemy of teaching kids how to think. So then what do you have to do instead? 95% of what kids have to respond to, whether they're taking the SAT or the ACT or you name it, 95% of those questions in the course of the grade assessment require them to go back to the text to support their response. So guess what has to happen on a regular basis in our classroom? The questions we ask them have to do what? Require them to do what? Go back to the text to support their response. But guess what? You're like the Israelites in the wilderness wandering for 40 years as it comes to citing textual evidence because you don't have a single solitary operational definition or process for what it means to cite textual evidence. So kids appear not to be able to read and respond to questions when their actual issue is how to cite textual evidence to support their response. Are y'all with me? I'm going to show you how to fix it in a second. Next, composition from sources. Right now in the kindergarten classroom, somewhere in the state of North Carolina, a kid is writing about a time when they felt sad, but guess what? Nobody cares. A kid is writing about a winter break, but nobody cares. What, how should they be writing? They should be writing from sources, which means what? As early as kindergarten, even if they can't read, somebody should be reading the kids multiple pieces of the text on volcanoes and then have them write or speak about volcanoes from sources. So I am not an expert on the proliferation of nuclear weapons in North Korea if I've only read one article. So when we ask kids to write, we're asking them to write from their experience that's inconsistent with assessment, or we're asking them to write from sources. And there are a certain number of ways that kids have to write from sources. I'm going to introduce you or reintroduce you to those. And then finally, the, this, the final one is academic language. How can you participate in a conversation on something and you don't and you're familiar with the language of the something? You're teaching kids, but if they don't acquire a conceptual understanding of the academic language that you're using while you're teaching them, when you ask them to demonstrate proficiency, they fall short. You don't know what I'm saying. Let me say it this way. In third grade, children have to identify key details in a, in a given information or a literary text in order to um, uh, determine the main idea of that text. But what does identify mean? What does key mean? What does detail mean? What does main mean? What does idea mean? Right now, you got a hundred different definitions for what all those terms mean. And it's having a, a negative impact on children's ability to demonstrate proficiency. I'm not talking about the test, because underperformance on the test is not about the zip code. Underperformance on the test is about the instruction in the zip code. And the extent to which the instruction is aligned through your common and conceptual understanding of the academic language that lives inside the standards. Because by the time kids get to ninth grade, they have to analyze U.S. similar documents of historical and literary significance with a focus on themes, purposes, and rhetorical features. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Are y'all with me? And so the language that we use from early on, I'm sorry to the two kids over there, I said, I said hell. Okay, they can't hear me. Okay, hell. Language has to be taught from the very beginning. And some people will say, well, wait a minute. My kids can't read, but they can still think. They don't read on grade level, but they can still absorb information. They can still absorb knowledge, okay? So now we'll turn to, on, to talk about the math side. Do any of you teach ELA and math and social studies and science? Okay, so I'm coming down your street. On the left-hand side of the screen, those are the international shifts that impact every content area with the exception of mathematics. On the right-hand side is the mathematics stuff. So if you don't teach math, hold on for a second. Math instruction should be focused, which means what? Teach a few things well. There's some things you're never going to cover. And the pacing guy is the enemy of good teaching. Because the pacing guy says, you got to be on the same page, you got to be on the same page, you got to be on the same page. But guess what? We don't have the same kids. Oh, you can clap on that. Stop playing. You know you want to clap over here. Okay, now what's my point? Because some people will hear that and say, I told those principals, I told those administrators, we can't be on the same place at the same time, but you're teaching one standard for nine weeks, I'm not talking to you. Because what you're doing is child abuse. <laughs> Every coin has two sides and an edge. And so I'm not saying you teach one standard for an entire quarter. That is not what I'm saying. 
I'm saying that you cannot possibly keep pace with the person next to you because you don't have the same ability levels in the classroom next to you. You have the same needs. Now, you shouldn't be so far away, but you can't be on the same page at all times. So this says, focus says in a math class, teach a few things well so they can stand on mastery of something. Because you try to teach everything, and you end up teaching nothing. The second an international shift for mathematics instruction is coherence, which means what? Make sure that your scope and sequence is coherent rather than incoherent. Because math should not be a series of new learning opportunities and disconnected, but it should be a series of interconnected opportunities, one that builds upon the other one. So if you simplify expressions, the next coherent thing to do is to solve, and solve equations. Simplify expressions, solve equations. Skip count, multiply. Are you with me? Procedural fluency. If you remember, not you 12, but most of us, when we were in grade school, the math teacher would say, stand up and count by eight. Y'all remember that? And your heart was beating through your chest. And your teacher expected you to be able to do it. Those opportunities are starting to slip away from us as public educators because we have to hurry up to teach so we can hurry up and test so we can find out kids need more time with us teaching. Oh, yeah, did somebody say preach? I'm trying. <laughs> so what does procedural fluency mean? It says that some things kids got to have with automaticity. And you have to create time and space in your classroom for them to get it. Even if it takes a little while, is that okay for you to make sure kids can count by two? You got to do it. Even if it's not in the curriculum, guys. Even if it's not in your scope and sequence, you got to make sure it happens because when they get involved in worthwhile mathematical tasks with multiple steps, they're going to fall apart if they don't have procedural fluency. Are y'all with me? Okay, now, conceptual understanding. Conceptual understanding is akin to conceptual understanding of academic language on the other side of the screen. Here's what we have to stop doing in math classrooms. Keep change flip. Don't worry about it. Just, just do keep change flip. And when you get down to the bottom of the page, circle your answer. So you got the answer, but you don't understand it. Because you use some kind of trick, you don't conceptually understand what you did when you multiplied a whole number by a fraction. Are y'all with me? Amen. So if you're teaching conceptual understanding of multiplying a whole number by a fraction, you don't tell kids to use the standard algorithm only. You also tell them they can uh, do repeated addition. You also tell them they can draw a model. So we teach in mathematics through procedural fluency only, because if we are, we create a generation of children who are math phobic and math incompetent. Are y'all with me? And then finally, application. A good math classroom is a classroom that, that it, it doesn't do this. Okay, y'all do the E, but y'all do the R. Because those problems have to be carefully selected to make sure that kids have opportunities to practice the discrete skills that they learn in a worthwhile, complicated mathematical task. When you go to the grocery store, nobody gives you a math problem, a page full of math problems and says, do this, do this while you wait. You do math in your head, you do math in situations. So a good math class is a math class that puts mathematics concepts into situations. What is that? What are problems for everybody, gifted and non-gifted? Are y'all with me? My brother's four years older than I. I could do his homework for him because all he had was discrete math problems. So I'm in the eighth grade, he's in the twelfth grade, I can do his work because all they're giving him is discrete math problems and no situations. And then finally, dual intensity. Are your math classrooms characterized by equal parts procedural fluency and equal parts conceptual understanding opportunities? So I'm going to pause here for a moment and have you turn and talk to somebody next to you. Where are you as a school, as a grade level, as a school, as a district, as it relates to these international shifts for instruction? Y'all, I was in Korea working for 60 days. These have been in place for a decade. America is just learning about these. So tell me the truth. Where are you as a school, as a grade level, as an organization? Talk to somebody next to you.
say, Grantville, talk to me. Let me call you back in three, call you back in two, call you back in one. Okay, call you back. What you said? You said, I'll repeat it for everybody to hear. Where are you as a grade level, as an individual, as a grade level, as an organization, as a school? Should I interpret the silence? How should I interpret the silence? Is there an opportunity for growth here? Because if you're saying you want children to get the proficiency finish line, because there are easier ways to make a living than teaching, right? So you're telling me I got to deal with all these personalities at one time? I got to deal with all these 500 people telling me how to do it and how to do it better? There are easier ways to make a living. So let me show you how to take the pain away. How you take the pain away? Your philosophy has to match your practice. So what do you believe in? Do you believe that children need exposure to a balance of information or literary text? Do you think kids need to understand the words that they see when they read? Brand research says if you don't understand 95% of the words that you see when you read, you won't be able to subsequently use the text to ascend the pyramid of cognitive demand, aka think. Do you think it's important for you to focus on a few mathematical concepts and get kids to mastery on those so they can have a foundation upon which to stand? That's your philosophy. So then your philosophy ought to match your practice. And as an organization across the country, this is across the country, you say you believe it, but your practice is inconsistent. So I have four practices I want to put in front of you so you can catapult your district to start up. And people are going to come running to you and ask you, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> are y'all ready? Yes. Okay, here it is. Children need access to instruction that is diagnostic and prescriptive and gives them opportunities to do what? Decode and encode. Now what does that mean? Decode means you said you, 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 you see words on the page and you can pronounce the words on the page. Y'all with me? But encoding is what? Spelling. And people have been telling us as elementary folks, spelling doesn't matter. The, the devil is alive and the truth is not in it. Because spelling does matter. And so the reason why kids have difficulty with spelling is because they don't have all, they don't they don't know the relationship between the 26 letters, the 44 sounds that those letters make, and the 144 different ways to write those letters, to write the sounds that they hear on the page. And so what you don't want is kids getting past you to sixth grade, and they don't understand the relationship between the 26, the 44, and the 144. I'll prove it to you in a minute. So decoding and encoding. And the second thing you want kids to be able to do is to create meaning as they read. Because you don't want sophisticated word calls. They call out the words on the page, but then you ask them a question relative to the words they call out on the page. And they can't answer the question because they weren't creating meaning while they were decoding and encoding. Y'all not saying something? Because you want kids to read the word egregious and you want them to be thinking, oh, the E in egregious means our. The greech and egregious means group. And the us in egregious means fully. So when they finish decoding egregious, they think in their mind fully standing out from the group. And that has to happen on a parallel pathway. At the same time they're decoding and encoding, they have to be creating meaning of what they read. And when they don't, they appear to be illiterate when in fact they've been underserved. They appear to be special ed, but in fact they've been underserved. Are y'all with me? And I mean even underserved before they got to you because by the time they get to kindergarten, they should know which letters make which sounds. So they were underserved in their community. They didn't get 3K. So here's what has to happen in real time. Kids see the word transportation, they gotta think, well, how do I spell trans? You gotta make decisions. They gotta make three decisions. How do you spell the word and transportation? How do you spell the hack and transportation? How do you spell the s and transportation? They're making that decision at the same time they should be thinking trans means across. Good luck. Are y'all with me? So they're not just spelling the word, they have to also understand what the part of the word means. So when they're done saying the word, they understand the word they've created meaning as they read it. Transportation is the act of carrying something across. But they gotta make a lot of decisions in a split second. Now, public education is over programmatized. You got a program for A, and if that program A doesn't work, you got B for A. And if program B doesn't work, because A didn't work, you got program C. You don't need another program. 
But what, what you need is ongoing professional learning on what it means to make sure that kids are becoming literate. That they what? Can decode and code. That they can create meaning. And then number three, that they can consume informational text. They can consume literary text and use what they've consumed to ascend the pyramid of cognitive demand, which means what? Go beyond what? Remembering what they read. Sally crossed the road in the text. What does Sally do in the text? Sally crossed the road. You didn't build a rocket. You're still on the ground. Good literacy instruction says now that you conceptually understand what you read. And it also gives children opportunities to apply discrete skills to reading opportunities. This is why you don't read Romeo and Juliet. You read Romeo and Juliet to teach characterization. This is why you don't read the little diary of the, what do you call it, the, the wimpy kid. To study it, you read it to teach them to apply a skill to it. Are y'all with me? So that kids have, can opportunities, have opportunities to stand back from the text and analyze the extent to which the author fulfilled the purpose of writing the text. What is that? That's second grade. In second grade, kids have to look to see which text features were used by the author to fulfill his or her purpose for writing. And they have to know what? There are four types of text features. And in those four types, there are 100 different examples. Graphic aid, informational aid, organizational aid. Y'all with me? Print feature. So that reading, the reading block is not just about reading something to, to remember it, but it's about reading something to use it to ascend the pyramid of cognitive demand. If you read a bunch of stories, should you be able to write one? If you read a bunch of poems, should you be able to write one? The pinnacle, the Shangri-La, the Sistine Chapel of teaching and learning is the top of the pyramid of cognitive demand, which is what? Creating something. What do you mean create? Determine the main topic is creating. Aren't you bringing into the world your understanding of what the main topic of the text is? Aren't you bringing into the world a summary? That's the top of the pyramid of cognitive demand. Right? So, let me say this to you. You've been, been told, you've been told for a very long time, if we could just align curriculum with instruction and assessment, we're going, to be, we're going to be cooking with gas and grease. But what does that mean? Aligning curriculum, instruction, and assessment actually means, what is our knowledge of the standards? If students have to identify the key details in the text in order to determine the central idea and summarize that text and take the personal opinions and judgments, what is our knowledge of the expectation of that standard? Because you've had these standards for eight years, and we've been unpacking them for eight years. How long do you going to unpack the same standard? Have you ever been invited? Have you been invited for the past eight years to unpack a standard? You should be tired of it. Somebody said it happened to be a month ago. So you've, been, you've had them for eight years. You should already have a resource that has the standards on at once and for all. And then in the POC or in your private time, you read what was already unpacked to the true expectation of the standard. And then you gotta make sure what? That the language you use when you teach that standard is consistent with how kids are gonna be assessed. Not that I'm worried about the assessment, but you want to make sure your instruction is having an impact. And then what tools are you being given to get kids to the proficiency finish line? Because some folks are still using those, those dittos from the wizard graph. I'm not coming at you old school. What I'm saying is everything you're using, every tool you're using, every tool you're putting in front of kids to get them to demonstrate proficiency, it's subject to scrutiny. Because it does not align to the true and nuanced expectation of the standard. It's busy work. Okay, so here are the four things I promised you. Number one, you take a notice, here's where you would take them. And by the way, you only have about 12 concepts to teach kids in ELA all year. So you think about the 300 page standards for, 300 pages of standards for ELA for North Carolina, it actually amounts to 12 concepts. So you got 10 informational text standards. Standard number 10 is not a standard, because it just says expose kids to informational text. Standard number 10 on the literary side is not a standard. It just says expose kids to a variety of literary texts. Standard number 8 on the literary side says not applicable because it refers to author's argument. So there are basically 18 standards that kids have to be taught over the course of the school year. It's actually 17 because standard number 1 on the informational side is on the screen behind me. Standard number 1 on the screen behind me is standard number 1 on the screen on the right hand side. Oh, it's not there. Thank you. <laughs> and y'all don't want to tell me. Thank you, ma'am. Tell me. Look at standard number one on the informational side. What does it say? It's either asking and answering questions or knowing what the tech model or homeless. Okay. Look at standard number one on the informational side. It says what? Know what the text says explicitly, or if you're K12, what is it? Ask and answer questions. But look on the right hand side. 
Y'all see it? No matter the time it takes that kid to read it, whether it's informational or it's literary, asking and answering questions and knowing what the text says explicitly is what? It's the same skill. So you don't have 17 standards to teach over the course of 180 days. You actually have what? 16. Are y'all with me? Look at standard number two on the informational side. It says what? Um, it says drawing references. Drawing references lives inside of standard number one. But look at it on the literary side. Does it say drawing references? It's the same. So you actually have 15 to teach over the course of 180 days. Go to the next one. Do you see summarizing the central idea? So the informational text says teach main idea K12. And then grade 3, 4, 5 teach, I'm sorry, main topic K12, main idea 3, 4, 5. Are y'all with me? And on the literary side, main idea becomes what? Moral or lesson. Isn't that the same concept conceptually? It is. It's the most major thought or idea. So we actually have 13 standards to teach over the course of 180 days. Y'all do the math. This tells me what? Slow down. Which is why you should never have a daily objective that you change every day because you got to teach the mastery. Yes. Y'all scared to clap? The superintendent, she, she, she didn't mind you clapping. She's here, your principals are hearing the same thing. And it's not anti, because they've already heard this before you. And they agree, which is why they asked me to come and stay, come and say it. So you don't need a daily objective because it's not real. Just like the daily lesson plan, it's not real. What do you mean it's not real? Because I'll get I'll, I'll turn to my lesson plans to you a week in advance, but guess what? It's not gonna be what I'm actually doing. Oh, you want to go time at a certain you want by midnight? Okay, no problem. Here it is. Sit. But you don't know what you're going to end up doing until they get in front of you. And so people have been asking, you know, do, do, do things that are based in the ice ages. Like write the state standard on the board. Y'all know that's ice ages? I'm going to get to that in a second. What's my point here? There's just a finite number of concepts that have to be taught over the course of a year. Slow down and teach kids to mastery so they can get to what? Transfer. What's better than mastery? Transfer. That no matter what situation they're in, somebody ask them to infer, they understand inferences conceptually so well that they can transfer their knowledge. Man, give me my clicker. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now, that was my introduction to the sermon. Here's the sermon. Four things you got to do. Four, four, four. Here's number one. Instead of putting the state standard on the board, write an objective that is a derivative of the standard. Something that you want children to accomplish over a period of, a, of time that cannot necessarily happen in one class period. Are y'all with me? Because some people would think, oh, if you don't finish this lesson, it ain't satisfactory. Yes, it is. I just got to make sure the kids, wherever I am in it, kids are with me and I'm collecting data as I go along to make sure that they're acquiring knowledge. And they're not acquiring knowledge and I go back to an earlier phase of the instruction. But what goes on the board for children is a performance-based objective. What does that mean? The ELC and the ELG, they're performance-based assessments. So then what? Every day I, the instruction that we put in front of kids should be what? By nature. Performance-based. Based on the performance. What do I mean by that? It's got to be one part content, you see it, and one part what? Think. One part content, one part higher order skill. But let me tell you, North Carolina, your objectives are flawed and content driven. So I'm indicting you without having been in your building because I'm in 38 states. I'm telling you what I'm going to see. And you, you know, you're unique, but not that unique. Here it is. I see these kinds of objectives. Flawed, which means what? Something's wrong with this in my spirit. I see something's wrong. Something's misplaced. It's an activity. It's usually an activity when it's flawed. Like we're gonna complete a KWL chart. Who cares? We're gonna complete a graphic organizer. Who cares? Maybe you use a graphic organizer, but that's not content. A graphic organizer is not high order thinking, though it may result in opportunities to think at a higher level. Y'all with me? The objective is your roadmap. This is how you, you know, I'm sending districts across the country, superintendents. Please don't require your teachers to hand in the lesson plan in advance. But what you replace it with, because you don't replace it with something, it's going to come back seven times stronger. That was a reference, that was a biblical reference, y'all. Y'all some heathen, y'all didn't know that. Y'all need to go to church. 
You got to replace it with something stronger. What's stronger than a lesson plan sitting on the right hand corner of your desk? An objective that every kid can see and they understand every word that's in it. That's stronger. So sometimes I see content driven objectives, which means what? It's good. It's right from the State Department. It's what kids need to know, but it doesn't ask them to think at a higher level. It's inconsistent with how they're going to be assessed for the rest of their natural lives. So then what's the shame around our Sistine Chapel of objectives? It is a performance-based objective that is accessible to kids. That means every kid can see it from where they're seated. Every adult who walks in the room knows exactly what you want kids to know or what you want them to do with what they know. And the observer can see it, so they can jump in instruction or they can jump in to evaluate instruction. It's better than looking for your lesson plan. So I'm going to put up three different, I'm going to put up objectives. Some of them are going to be flawed. Some of them are going to be content driven. Some of them are going to be performance based. I'm going to ask you to turn and talk to somebody next to you and tell me, this, which a category does this objective fall? If it's flawed, it's an activity or it's something misplaced. If it's content driven, it's good, but it's not asking them to think at a high level. And if performance based, it's one part content and one part higher I think, let's do one. SWBAT means students will be able to. So read that objective and categorize it based upon the three categories at the top of the screen. Turn and talk to somebody next to you. How many say flawed? How many say content driven? How many say performance based? Content driven. Why? It's good. You want, don't you want kids to read something in grades three, four, and five, and then identify the way that it was structured? Was it descriptive? Was it comparing contrast as a text structure that they often use? Was it chronological, which means ordered by time? Was it sequential, ordered without time? Was it cause and effect, or was it problem solution? That's good content, three, four, five, yes? But it doesn't ask you to do anything with it. The writers of the assessment are sitting in a corner somewhere, make sure every question they ask connects to concepts. So a content-driven opportunity connected to a performance opportunity. Let's rewrite it. That's what should be on the board. IOT means in order to. So what does it say? Students will what? Be able to do what? Identify a text structure used by an author. Is that content? In order to do what? Subsequently do what? Go up the pyramid of cognitive demand and do something more complicated. Compose an original text using one or more of the informational text structures. Are y'all with me? That's rigor. You will not have rigor without your objective prompting the rigor. Because, you, if, because if that were the case, you were writing the state standard on the board out of compliance would have made rigor happen. So it's about the objective being performance based. Like if objectives were fraternities, this would be the cap out facade of objectives. Y'all with me? Okay. I'm stuck on my college fraternity. Right. Let's do another one. Read that one. Tell me, how is it structured? You see an activity? So because you see an activity, you automatically know it's what? Flawed. You, so yeah, you might use a jigsaw, but that's not what you want kids to walk away with, is it? You want them to walk away with content knowledge and an ability to use the content. Okay, let's rewrite it. This is what should be on the board. Identify what? Key details. In order to do what? Determine the what? Main idea of a text or a portion of a text. What's the content? Typically, you will see an objective that says, we're going to identify key details. Guess what? You're still on the ground. It has to be connected to something that is performance based in nature. Now, if you came one and two, that wouldn't be your objective. It would say main topic. Are y'all with me? Now, here's a springboard. That objective should prompt you to do what for kids before you ever pick up a piece of text to determine its main idea. What should it prompt you to do? Think about academic language, conceptual understanding of academic language. What should we do first? Make sure that kids understand what? What it means to do what? Identify. Is there another word that might be a mystery to kids? Determine. You went too far. Back up. Key. What does a key do to a door? It opens it. So what does a key detail do in a text? 
It helps you to do what? Open up, understand, determine the main idea and the main topic of the text. So y'all with me? What do kids highlight when you give them a highlighter? Everything. Because they don't know the difference between a key detail and a non-key detail. Are y'all with me? So the objective is a springboard for teaching conceptual understanding of the language of the standard. Let's do another one. Determine an idea of a text in order to summarize distinct or personal opinions and judgments. What kind of objective is that? Where's the content? Read the content to me. The, of the text. In order to do what? Go up the pyramid of cognitive demand. So every kid needs to see this when they walk to your classroom on a regular basis. I'm showing you how to give kids to proficiency. I'm trying to show you how to give kids access to a choice-filled life, rather than a life that's characterized by other people choosing for them. Because they can't handle these basic skills. Life is going to eat them alive. Now, what do you mean, Doc? You're telling me I need to tell kids these words? They can't handle these words. Yes, they can. If we expose them to them, they know every rap song that they want to know the words to. Okay. Let me go to another content area. Let me go to uh, social studies. I'll give you the answer for that one. Let me do it anyway. Draw a map of Africa and Asia and label it. It is, for many reasons. It's an activity, and it doesn't answer the question of what are kids going to do with their ability to draw and label that map. So what should it say? Why would you want to draw and label a map of Asia and Africa if not to compare and contrast the human and natural and capital resources on both continents? Now, what does that objective say to do next? Teach kids every word that's in it. Because sometimes they don't know what the word continent is, means. They don't know there's seven of them. So, but don't we say all the time, kids, they just don't have background knowledge. Here's the opportunity. It's through the objective. Okay? Let's go to another content. Let's do math. Let's do this one. What kind of objective is that? Depends on what grade you teach. If you're K1 and 2, what are you thinking? Content. If you're 3, 4, 5, what are you thinking? Flawed. But it's actually the content of kindergarten to teach kids to count to 10. Okay? So let's count to 10. Do it with me. 1, 2. I'm going to show you the ridiculousness of it. Start over. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. What just happened for kids? Nothing. So they remember those 10 numbers, so what? But the standard prompts you to do something else for kids, which will prompt you to do something else in the objective. Why do you want kids to count from 1 to 10 to teach them what? Uh, ultimately. 1 to 1 what? Correspondence. So you say a number, and they associate a number with a number of objects. Like 10 fingers. Y'all with me? Okay. So, but in the standards, it even goes even further and says that kids have to, should be able to like, account from 1 to 10 in order to compose and decompose composite figures. So I was working with a school in Louisiana. I've been working with them for a number of months. I was coming back on a visit to see the extent to which they were able to, you know, implement, implementing these practices, putting up an objective and make sure it's performance-based in nature. And I walked into this kindergarten classroom and this little girl, I said to her, I said, what are y'all doing? Six years old. She said, we're composing and decomposing composite figures. And she looked at me like, you didn't know that? Kindergarten in the housing project, she said, we're composing and decomposing composite figures. So I want to ask her a question. I said, what does compose mean? And she said, she, she said, it's not a problem. She said, it means to make. So the teacher tells me a number between 1 and 10, like 6, and I'm supposed to reach into this box of Legos, and I'm supposed to make or create a composite figure by clicking them together. Are y'all with me? Six years old. This means that they, they got exposed. So when I said compose, she didn't fall apart. She went to her understanding of compose, which means to make. And she explained it to me how she pulled the Lego blocks to do so. So then I said, well, let me separate, you know, what I think about her from who she really is academically. So I said, well, what does decompose mean? And she said to me, six years old, no exaggeration, that D-E in front of decompose means away. 
So when teacher says decompose the composite figure, she wants me to pull the Lego blocks away from each other. What kind of high schooler is she going to be? Because she got exposure to the academic language of the standard through the, object, through the daily objective. That doesn't change because somebody says change it. It changes because most of the classroom is at mastery. Are y'all with me? That's service to kids. Okay. And I'm going to stop there and say to you, this applies to art and music and phys ed. How? Because typically, elective courses, they get relegated to the sideline, but they're actually an integral part of improving student outcomes through literacy development. What words live inside of that objective for music that cross content areas and grades that kids have to know? Name one of them. Distinguish. So that's one of the words that cross content areas. So my 36th book is called Universal Language of Literacy uh, on Shelves in January. In it, I talk about there's a finite number of words that kids just have to know, and if they know them, it's going to impact their ability to handle content across disciplines. And so if we just say, okay, we're going to, we're going to play music today, class, okay, pick up an instrument, just play. Are we taking advantage of an opportunity to make sure kids are becoming more literate through our objective? So we're saying to the music teacher, there's some words that kids know, and you can play a part, and kids need to know, and you can play a part in helping to make sure that they know them. Are y'all with me? The same is true for the other content. So I'm going to pause for a moment, and I'm going to ask you to turn and talk to somebody next to you. What are you thinking about this concept of writing performance-based objectives? Does it just feel like, man, something else the district might be asking me to do? I hate this place. I'm leaving. <laughs> what are you thinking about it? Turn and talk to somebody. so that they can merge their access with their skills to be mastery. Yeah, okay. Here's what the young lady just said. She looks 12 too. So, but here's what, here's what 12 said. This is really about access. This is really about equity. Are you with me? So people thought that giving us this you know, set of common core standards was going to make sure that kids had equitable access to instruction of the highest quality, and it failed. Because it's not about the standards, it's about our understanding of every word that lives inside of the standard. And making sure that every kid, every child, has access to the operational definition of the terms that live inside of the standard. Because what, what, what composed means to me has to mean the same thing to you, 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 to make sure that every kid, no matter whose classroom they're sitting in, has access to what compose means consistent with how, how they're going to be assessed. Are y'all with me? Okay, what else are you thinking? Give me, give me one more. I'll repeat it. I won't bring the mic. You just say it. Okay, 
Somebody said it takes times and years of this. It doesn't happen overnight. Let me tell you what can happen overnight. I hear you. Let me tell you what can happen overnight. A shift in practice. Because if you decide, you say, well, every word I put up in front of kids, I'm just going to do a quick check to make sure they understand it because I'm going to be using it. That can happen overnight. This is why every school district that I work with, they start here and they end up here after just one year of implementation of these ideas. So I'm not going to just name countless, countless school districts that were either high performing and became higher performing or were low and jumped to the top after one year of implementing these practices. But imagine if you implemented this practice over the course of a child's K-12 career. What would happen? What, what would that capacity be reflective of? Okay? So I'm going to move to practice number two. Practice number two says, I'm going to do an activity and I'm going to have you write something on that post-it note that you have. Practice number two says, teach kids what? Words. You ever watch the 5 o'clock news? Who do they always hand the microphone to? Who do they always hand the microphone to? They have no teeth and no words. You know the lady I'm talking about? It's a fire. Ain't nobody got time for that. Y'all know that lady? They didn't teach her words. I just went too far. Sorry. But what's my point? You ever ask kids to answer questions and they say, nice, or yeah, I like it, good. They don't have words. And so the kid, a kid who reads below grade level has 2,500 words in that lexicon. A child who reads all or above has 25,000. So we got to multiply our underperforming students from 2,500 to 25,000, and they don't like to read. Because in the absence of being an avid reader, you don't pick up new words. So how, what words do, do kids need to know? They need to know general words, and they need to know domain-specific words. What's a general word? Tier 2. What's tier 2 mean? It's a word that crosses continuities and grades, like infer, explain, describe, compare, contrast. Ask kids what those words mean, and they will, they will not know. But those words are wrapped up in the social studies assessment. They're wrapped up in the science assessment. They're wrapped up in the mathematics assessment. And they're certainly coming to the forefront in the ELA assessment. But there's a, there, those words are a mystery to them. I'm going to prove it to you in a second. And then there are domain-specific words, which are words that live in a particular content area, like onomatopoeia, personification, and ELA, like gestalt and art, like mitosis and science, like sovereignty and social studies. There are opportunities that we are missing to teach kids conceptual understanding of those words, because then we want them to demonstrate mastery of our content, but they don't have the language. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of the letter from the Birmingham jail. I know that's a complicated text. I know you're elementary, but you're, you're educated. Okay? Letter from Birmingham Judge, Dr. King got locked up, right? Because he was somewhere helping some, some folks to protest who called and asked him to come. And he was pissed off. He was in jail and they weren't. And he wrote that letter. He went off on everybody who was listening. He, he went off on the local clergy. That text has a tone. If you watch the most recent uh, uh, State of the Union address, that manuscript that the president delivered, whether you like it or not, it had a tone. Are y'all with me? A uh, letter written by Susan B. Anthony about women's right to vote, written to a congressman at the time. That piece of text had a tone. The writers of the assessments, whether it be norm reference or criteria reference, end of grade, end of course assessments, they assume that kids have been exposed to operational definitions of key terms from pre-K all the way up. And I'm telling you, the Israelites, you, 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 you're in the wilderness. You're wandering. For 40 years, speaking different languages. But you're saying you're a part of a school system. But a school system, the parts are supposed to work together to perform the same function. And as it relates to academic language, you've yet to get there. Not an indictment, you can fix it right now. So on your post-it note, I want you to think of this, uh, give me a definition to this word. Informational text tone. Every piece of informational text ever read, ever written, has a tone. Write the definition for tone on your post-it note and be ready to pass it to the center aisle and I'll come up and get it. Don't write your name on it. Don't fold it. And if you don't know, write, I don't know. What is tone? And I'm going to show you something that's happening in classrooms across your district and in your state and across the country. And I call it instructional carbon monoxide. 
Everybody have a post to note? Want everybody to write and hand me something, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Frank. You want to get it for me? You got it. Pass it to the center and we'll come up and get them. What is tone as it relates to informational text? Do it quickly, guys. I don't want to run out of time. I have 20 more minutes, 25 more minutes with you, I think. Pass it to the center, please. volunteers to join me. I won't have you write anything. I'm going to have you say anything. I'll just have you stand up here with me. I need three volunteers. Come on, young lady. Yes, ma'am. That's you. Thank you. Come on up here with me. I need two more folks to join me. Okay, thank you. Come on down. Thank you. Thank you. I need one more volunteer. I need one. Oh, you're going to stand with me, Doc? You're about to. Okay. Now, last volunteer, I need you to come hold these for me. Come on, Frank. All right. Now, I'm going to put these post it notes into three categories. I'm going to read some of them randomly so you can see random selection, okay? And I'm going to hand them to you if they're correct. Put them in three categories. Correct? You're going to be incorrect, Deborah? And that's perfect. All right. <laughs> uh, that was really supportive. All right. Okay. And then, sir, you're going to be close, but no. 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 Here we go. I'm going to give you the textbook definition of tone. And it's going to be awkward. And if I read yours and poke fun in your answer, it's okay. We're going to have fun. Okay. And some of them are going to be wrong, and I'm going to poke fun. All right. So, but I'm going to do it to prove a reason, to prove a point. Okay, here's tone. Tone is the author's attitude toward the subject of the text, period. Tone is the author's attitude toward the subject of the text. Okay, let's see what you wrote. An expression that something is read, incorrect. Attitude of the writer, that's correct. The information is boring, monotonous and confusing. confusing. And so is that response, all right? <laughs> Just jumping back, all right. Uh, mood, emotion elicited from the text. Mood and tone are often conflated one for the other. Mood is the predominant feeling of a literary work, where the tone is the author's attitude toward the subject of the text. What do you have to do? Calibrate your understanding of these concepts at cross grade levels. Because when you calibrate, you're going to push your whole district forward. Not just bubble kids, everybody. Emotion that is driving the work, incorrect. Emotions or feelings or mood or passage of the text, incorrect. What the, how the author feels about the subject that they're writing about, correct. Emotion. Mood. Mood of the author. Okay, man, this is not your turn, okay? You're, you're not the star up here. I'm here. So you stand on back over there. All right. I'm just kidding. All right. No, I'm not. All right. The mood of the author or the writer. Tone is the intention of how the author feels. Sound. I don't know. The way you comment. I don't know. Feeling. Okay. Do you want me to keep going? If you say yeah, you are blood for punishment. What's, look at this distribution. Look at the distribution. Correct, incorrect, close but not. What does the distribution tell us? We don't know. <laughs> Yo, this is not an indictment. Because each of you can pick up a teacher resource and teach tone to mastery and transfer. That's not what this is about. The answer is not, we need to get it right. That's not the answer. That's not the analysis I want you to walk away with. You're missing it if you're thinking that. 
What should you be thinking? Think about what I read out loud. They were all what? Different. So a child goes from one grade to the next grade, or one class to the next class, and they get a different definition of a general word. So they get to the state assessment and they appear to be unproficient, not proficient. Excuse my made up a word. They appear to be not proficient, but they actually haven't had access to the academic language in an operational way. So they appear to be instructionally schizophrenic. They hear voices. Whose voices do they hear? Every teacher who taught them before you and said, tone is actually this. Tone is actually that. Y'all, do you, you see this point? So then what do you need? You need a resource that gives you the definition for general and domain-specific words. What are you thinking? Turn to talk to somebody next to you. What are you thinking? Call you back. I don't want to run out of time. That's kind of quick. That's quick, quick, quick. Call you back in three. Call you back in two. Call you back in one. I know you see the point that was made. Because I know some people think, you know, you think this song is about you. Don't you? Don't you? <laughs> it's not about you. It's about what you collectively believe is the definition of those terms that live inside of the standards. For which there must be a single operational definition. Because people say, well, you know, I want my kids to be exposed to kid-friendly definitions. Well, it's unfriendly not to give them that actual definition. Are y'all with me? Because, you know, kid-friendly is watered down for a low expectation. So what, so what is a summary? It's a brief statement that contains the essential ideas of a longer passage. Period. What does it mean to compare? No similarities. What does it mean to contrast? No differences. What's an inference? It's not an educated guess. It's a logical assumption based upon information from the text, plus prior knowledge or experience. What is an equation? It's a mathematical statement that establishes equivalency. Do you all see it? They need access to the language. The writers of the assessment think they've been exposed. So then what do you do? Let's say this is your objective. Okay, class, we're going to cite strong and thorough textual evidence in order to support an analysis of what the text says explicitly, as well as inferences that are drawn from the text. You see that objective? I put that on the board. I may as well put it up there in French. Are you, am I, did you hear me? Because the language is a mystery to them. So what do we do about it? Okay, class, you're going to become my, my fifth grade classes for a few minutes. Y'all ready? Action. Class, today we're going to be citing strong and thorough textual evidence in order to support an analysis of what the text says explicitly, as well as inferences drawn from the text. But there are some words in that objective that are a mystery to you, and I can't afford for them to be a mystery to you when we start reading text and citing strong and thorough textual evidence to support an analysis of what those texts will say explicitly, as well as the inferences that we might draw from them. Okay, good. Joe, you're on my street, okay? So you, you're proving my point. So I'm going to say to you, class, and make me come out of character again, class, are there any words in this objective that are a mystery to you? And by the way, you do not poke fun at someone who wants knowledge. So if they're asking it, you probably need to ask it. So you got to have an environment that, that says, I'm gonna, I got your back if you ask me a question. But these kids will tear each other down. So tell me, is there a word that's a mystery to you? Call it out. Sight. Is there another one? Analysis. You went too far. There are many words in that objective that might be a mystery to you. Yes? Okay, class. I'm glad you called them out. Here they are. I predicted what you would say. Now, let's talk about each word because i got to make sure you know it. But cool. well, guess who has to know it first? Here we go. Watch this. A citation is when you cite something, you tell me, class, the location of what you found. It's not what you found. It's where you found it. So when I say citation, I want you to think what? Location. Like what? Page number, paragraph, line number. And when you get to college, your citations will change. 
to a person's name and the year that they wrote it. But for now, it's going to be about page number, paragraph, line number. Or it's going to be about scene, act. Or it's going to be about stanza, line. But for now, think page, paragraph, line number, location. When I say citation, what I want you to say, class, location. Now, we're going to cite strong and thorough textual evidence. Now, something that's strong is able to perform a specified action that does not go forward or return forward without having accomplished its purpose is powerful. So when I say strong, you think what? Powerful. Citation, location. Strong, powerful. So I'm going to ask you to cite powerful textual evidence. So when I say strong, I want you to think powerful. That's not any other evidence. It's powerful. Okay? There's another word we need to know. You told me you need to know thorough. Something that is thorough is done with great care and it's complete. Kind of like your prom outfit back in the day. It was, it was thorough. It was done with great care. And it was not leaving, it didn't leave anything to chance. Ladies, you dyed your shoe to match your dress. Y'all remember that? Y'all come rushing back? You had to have it dyed or you'd be happy. Okay? And fellas, you had to drive the right car. Right? And if you didn't have the right car, it, it, it messed up your outfit. Okay? Because you wanted to be thorough that night. Okay? You wanted to look like you could afford stuff you could not actually afford. <laughs> now, class, textual evidence. Textual. Look at the word textual. It has a suffix on the end of the class. What's the suffix at the end of textual? A-L, which means what? Related to. So textual evidence is related to or of the text. So when I ask you for textual evidence, I'm not asking you to lean to your own understanding. I'm saying, go to the text. Now, evidence, what does evidence mean? Another word for evidence starts with a P. What is it, y'all? Proof. So what is textual evidence? Proof of the text. So we're going to be citing strong and thorough textual evidence. Citation. Strong. Thorough. Textual evidence. Proof of the text. Okay, good. We're on our way there. Support. What's support in the chair you're seated at? The legs, right? The base is holding it up. So we're going to be supporting, which means to hold up. Okay, now analysis. Analysis is actually a past tense word, but it, but it doesn't have ED on it because something's already been analyzed. And I know you've been told, class, that when you analyze something, you break it down, but it's not true. You actually break it apart. So look at your right hand. Let's analyze your right hand. Let's break it apart. One of the constituent elements are parts of your right hand. Call it out. Fingers, thumb. Palm, what else? Fingernails. Fingernails. Flip it, what else? Skin. Notice none of you said ring, because if you take that ring off, what do you still have? A hand. So when you analyze something, you pull it apart. So when I ask you to analyze textual evidence, I'm asking you to do what with the sentences? Pull them apart. Class, we're almost there. Explicit. EX. Do you see a prefix in front of the word explicit? Yep, yeah, it's EX, which means what? Out. And so something that is explicitly stated in the text is stated outwardly. It's right there on the text. And then finally, the word inference. It's not an educated guess. It's a logical assumption based on information from the text plus prior knowledge and or experience. So be kind, real quick. Make an inference about me, a logical assumption about your presenter. That I'm a preacher, right? Now, now, is that a logical assumption? But what is it based on? Go back to your prior knowledge. Go back to your experience. So what you said I was a preacher, now prove it. Give me prior knowledge or experience. I named the nominations. What else did I do? I made scripture references. And people who can do that are probably what? There's the inference. Are y'all with me? Now, an inference doesn't have to be true. I could be a heathen from the south side of hell, but I know the word. Are y'all with me? It's just logical. Now, do kids know? Okay, so class, here's what we're doing. See, you think I'm going down a rabbit hole, but I'm actually changing your instructional life right now. Watch. Class, we're actually today and over the next few days, we're going to be noting the location of powerful, complete information taken directly from the text to hold up the parts of what is said and assumed. When it does happen for K-5 kids, what do you think is going to happen with their, if somebody puts the microphone in front of them on the 5 o'clock news? They're going to have words. And hopefully teeth. <laughs> we 
because if all year long, all career long, they've been exposed to the actual academic language that makes up the objectives that are on the board, it's not a mystery to them anymore. So what do kids need access to? Watch this. You don't prove that kids need access to it. What is sight? What I want you to remember when I say sight. Okay. Uh-huh. Strong. Thorough. Textual evidence. Support. Analysis. Explicit. Outwardly stated. And an inference. Logical what? There it is. Oh, okay, you got English language learner in here. I don't want you to draw a statement. I want you to make an inference. Are children getting this in Greenville? I know you think this song is about you. I'm not talking about you as an individual. I do this. I'm not talking about you. I'm saying collectively, is this part of your strategy to improve student outcomes? Then we have a responsibility to try it to see how it will help kids. And I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here, this is going to push your kids to proficiency and beyond, and it's going to happen overnight. There are high performance schools across the country, and nothing's on the board, and nothing's on the wall. Nothing's on a bulletin board anywhere in the building, and they're high performing. Because it doesn't matter what you put on the wall if you don't put it in their heads. You can clap on that. So this is what has to be up for kids. So you say, God, look at all those big words. My kids they can't handle those words and draw a picture of it. K-1 and 2, if you put the word setting in your objective, draw a picture of a little house and tell them that's where it takes place. They need, you know, visual representation of information that they can't handle the word. Y'all with me? Character, you just draw some thick people. And they give a good thing. Oh, those are the people or the personality that make up the story. Okay, I'm running out of time. So let me go to practice number three. I'm going to ask you a question. How did you learn how to ride a bicycle? Practice? Did you just push, did you, just push you out to the street? <laughs> Train the wheels? If they pushed you out to the street, y'all, that was child abuse. Okay. How, how did you learn how to um, ride a bicycle? I mean, how did you learn how to curse? You heard it, you practice it, you like how I felt, now you do it with the best. It's gravity release of responsibility, y'all. And so kids need practice with gravity release of responsibility. So let me show you this. They need on a regular basis you saying to them, look at that word emancipation. That's a big word, isn't it? But I can't afford for you to skip over words when you read, because you gotta understand 95% of the words that you read in order to be literate. So if kids have access to the 30 most commonly used prefixes, the 30 most commonly used root words, the 30 most commonly used suffixes, they can make sense of any word. And your children will be below grade level, but they don't know word parts. So they read the word, but they don't want to know what the parts of the word mean. So they constantly need, when they approach a word that they don't know, they need to understand the parts of it. So what's the first part in emancipation? E. Second part, man. Second part, C-I-P-A-T. Third part, T-I-O-N. Notice I did not say shun, because shun is not always spelled T-I-O-N, occasion. So you got to tell them T-I-O-N means something. You all with me? So now, what does E mean in front of a word? Sometimes. Out. Not all the time, because elephant does not mean out la fun. <laughs> Man refers to people. C-I-P-A-T refers to, the, to take part, like participate. And T-I-O-N at the end of the word means act or process. So what, is it, what does emancipation mean? It means the act of people coming out of, taking part in something. And notice I didn't read from left to right. Did I? So kids need access not only to the work parts, but they need access to juggling the work parts until they create meaning while they are reading. So they get to the end of the page, they can use what they read on the page to ascend the pyramid of cognitive demand. Look at the proclamation. Pro, C-L-A-M, T-I-O-N, in favor of, to say, act of. So what does proclamation mean? The act of what? Saying that you're what? In favor of what? Something. So then what is the Emancipation Proclamation? It's the act of saying you're in favor of people coming out of, taking part in something. Now that sounds complicated, but could, but could this not happen with words like unhappy? Because I'm coming down to elementary. So every time they see you in, you say, what does that mean? It means not. So every time you see you in, you, that's a clue for what that word means. They see O-U-S at the end of the word, they know it means fully or full of. You're going to multiply their vocabulary because they understand the parts of the words that they see when they read. 
It applies to mathematics. Look at that. What's the prefix in percentage? What's the root word in percentage? What's the suffix in percentage? But then what do they mean? So what is a percentage conceptually? A measure out of 100. I didn't read it from left to right. And the reason why children have difficulty converting percentages to decimals is because they don't know conceptually that a percentage is simply a measure out of 100. The same is true for science. I'm in science classrooms across the country and I see the word metamorphosis, but nobody breaks the word apart to say, well, what is metamorphosis? It's a process of what? Changing shape. So that when kids see those word parts, not only they, they will be able to read for a lifetime because they understand the parts of the words. 97% of the words that kids will see when they read come from 30 prefixes, 30 root words, and 30 suffixes. What is our understanding of them as an organization? Now, I asked you about grad release and responsibility because it's about, I gotta do this, y'all, gotta do this, gotta do this. You know how we took that objective apart and we talked about every word that was in it? The same has to be true for the text that kids read. I'm out of, I'm out I, I, I only have what? 15, okay. Remember we talked about the objective and we have to annotate the objective? We also have to annotate the text that we read with kids. If we want kids to read that text and determine the main idea, then guess what can't be a barrier for them? The words that are in it. So they should simply just say, hey, guys, we're going to read this text. Scan it real fast and tell me if there are words you don't understand. We're going to write them in the margin, the definitions for those words. And you think, I don't have time for this. Because Central Office wants me to be at this place at this time. Now, you can't serve two masters. You're going to clean the one, you're going to despise the other. So what are you going to do? You have to do what's in the best interest of kids, even if you never make it to the end of that pacing guide. Because what's in the best interest of kids? You know why behaviors crop up? They don't understand. So they're doing everything they can to make sure nobody knows they don't understand. So my question to you was, how did you, oh, I want to do this, but I don't have time to do it. So I'm clicking through it, guys. What are these? These are the relationships between the phonemes and the graphemes. And look at number six. That sound is ch, right? But then how do you spell it? It can be spelled four different ways. J, y'all see it? G. G E or even D G E, but a kid who doesn't understand that that phoneme is J, they will see, they will hear, they will see D G E and think it's do the J. Are y'all with me? And they spell just like they think. Okay, so I'm gonna do this because this is the third practice, and I gotta get to the fourth one. Okay, um, my, my this thing has a demon, y'all. I'm not even pressing anything in this. Okay, now. Remember I asked you how did you learn how to ride a bicycle? You say you practice. Grab release of responsibility is the best way to plan your instruction for ELA. It's the best way to plan your instruction for mathematics. It's the best way to plan your instruction for social studies and related courses like electives. But it's not the best way to teach science because science should be inquiry based. Right? Good science instructor says, I'm going to hook you. That's engage. And then good science instructor says, then I'm going to let you explore it without explaining it to you. That's the second phase. The third phase of good science instruction says, now I'm going to explain it to you. So what you didn't understand from engagement, from exploration, I'm now going to have you read something, I'm going to lecture something, so that you can understand what gravity is and what gravity isn't. That's the third E. The fourth E relates to elaborate. And it, in the middle of the word elaborate is the word what? Lab, which means that science instruction cannot be worksheets only. Kids have to touch science, they have to do science. And the final fifth phase is evaluate, which means give them some kind of assessment to assess the extent to which they understand. But everything else should be taught by grad release of responsibility. So what's the first phase of grad release of responsibility? I do it. So I'm going to model exactly what that objective says. If it says we're going to identify key details, determine the main topic of the text, that's what I'm going to show you how to do it. For the most part, you're going to sit and watch me. But K through five kids, they're squirrely, y'all. So they can't sit still the whole time. So if you think you're going to model for them, they're just going to sit there perfectly. you got another thing coming. So then you have to engage them a little bit, even in your I do, because you don't want to lose your audience. Are you right? Am I right? Now, adults, I can talk to you for 45 minutes, and you'll listen because you have an interest in learning and being better, but not so much with them. So the first phase of graduation responsibility is I'm going to model for you, and you're going to watch me. That's where it says observe over there. Then the second phase of graduation responsibility is now we're going to do it together. But who's the we in the we do? 
Because if I just ask you what the answer is to question number four, and you're the only person that gives me the answer, guess what? We didn't do it. So what I have to do in phase two of graduate responsibility is to go from modeling and change into what? So that F word, what does it say? Facilitation. Which means what? I start only doing what? Asking what? Questions. So when I model, I ask the question and I answer it. But when I go to the second phase of graduate responsibility, I ask the question, I mean, I allow you to, I ask the question and I allow you to answer it. I say, what do I do next? What do you think I should do next? Do you agree that's what we should do next? What do you think what we do? What do you think we should do? This is why children go home filled with energy and we go home tired when we continue to model in the we do. Are y'all with me? And kids learn, learn helplessness. So you know, my 14 year old will come home and say, I said, what did you do today? I don't remember. You did nothing. Because the teacher modeled for you the whole time. Because if you actually did it, you would remember. And so what he's telling me is that we, the teacher modeled the whole time, and then the bell rang. I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but y'all see my point. So I do, I model, we do, everybody in the classroom participates. And there's no such thing as I don't want to talk. So I'm coming to you eventually. I'm not going to call you out right now. But in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you a question. Be ready. So I can combat the kids who are shy, but I still need to know what you think because I'm responsible for your development. Now, the third phase of graduation responsibility is what? Pairs, not groups of three. You put two girls with a boy in a group, guess who's doing nothing? <laughs> you put a high with a low, guess who's doing all the work? So they need to be able to grapple evenly. You put five kids in a group, guess what they're going to be talking about? Not the content. Are you with me? They're going off topic. So the research says the best way to gradually release kids is to model for them, control the environment, put them in the we do when you get around that room and find out how many kids know what. So that then when you put them in pairs, you know how to pair them. And then what's the fourth and final phase of gradual release and responsibility? You do it alone. Now how do you know they're ready for it? Because you've been collecting data all along. When you were in the IV, when you were modeling, and they were looking at you like you had four heads, that was data. When you said, now think out loud, I want you to tell me what you're thinking in the we do, that was data you were collecting. And when you put them in pairs, you went on your cell phone. You were looking over their shoulders to see what they were doing in the pairs so you could decide who am I going to pair them with and who's going to be in my small group at the kidney shaped table. Who's not ready to work in a partnership? Come over here. Is this happening at the level that you want it to in your organization? Because the minute it does, this happens for kids, they're going to they're going to realize, oh, I have to think. What do kids have to do, y'all? Think. So graduate responsibility says you're going to think for the majority of the lesson. Which for, which of the phases of graduate responsibility are kids required to think in? Phases two, three, and four. And on four, they're at it all by themselves. Guess what happens? If kids get through, if get through all four of the phases of graduate responsibility, by the way, I was and when I was a high school English teacher, my AP said to me, you got to get through all four of those phases in one lesson or you're going to be unsatisfactory. And I said, you must be an idiot. I said it in my head, though. <laughs> it's not designed for you to get through it in one class period. It's designed for you to move when kids are ready for you to move to the next phase. Y'all see it? And then finally, because my time is up, I have five minutes left. The last practice I want to introduce you to is writing. Reading is breathing in and writing is breathing out. They need breathing out opportunities characterized by writing. Now how, do kids, how should kids be writing? Writing to inform, writing to explain, writing to express an opinion, K-5, and writing a narrative. But it's gotta be from what? Sources, which means what? Remember when I said kids you know, write about the time they felt sad and it's, you know, nobody cares and you didn't laugh, that was a joke, you were supposed to laugh? What am I saying there? Kids should be writing in a way that is informed by the standards. And the standards say kids should write to give you information about something after having read on that topic from multiple sources. And then kids should be writing to explain a process to you. Because what's the difference between writing to inform and writing to explain? Inform, factual. Explain, process. 
But in your state standards, they're setting you up to fail because inform is separated by a forward slash. Separated from explain by a forward slash, which means what? When you see something separated by a forward slash, you think they mean the same thing, but they don't. So kids need inform separate from explain, separate from right to express an opinion. What do you mean right to express an opinion? They need to read multiple pieces of text that have a perspective on a particular topic, and they need the right to express their opinion on the topic. And notice you don't see persuasive letters up there. It's been gone from the standard for eight years. Let it go. Opinion is stronger than persuasive, which sets them up to be able to formulate arguments in the latter grades, and then finally compose a narrative. And by the way, kids should not be writing informative explanatory or opinion text if they don't know how to structure the text. So now I'm talking to three, four, and five. How do you structure the text? What does that mean? There are six ways that you structure a text. You see them? Descriptive? Oh, my fault. There are six ways you structure a text. Descriptive, you see it? Tells you what one person, place, thing, or idea is like. And then there's a second one. Compare and contrast which tells you what two or more person, place, and things, or ideas are like. What kind of text are you writing if you're using one of those text structures? Look on the left hand side of the screen. If you're writing to inform, which one of those text structures are you going to use? You see it? So kids just start writing. And then they ask you this question. Well, how many sentences do you want me to write? And then they ask you that? It's because they don't know how to structure it. Because if they knew how to structure it, they wouldn't ask you. They would simply answer the question. And when they were done answering the question, they would stop writing. But because they don't know, those six on the right hand side of the screen are related to the four on the left hand side of the screen. And when you're writing to inform, you gotta pick the structure. When you're writing to explain, you gotta pick the structure. When you're writing to express an opinion on something, you have to pick the structure. That's the third, fourth, and fifth grade, all the way up to twelfth grade, instructional imperative. So here's what I would say to you in my closing. There are four things that we have to make sure kids do. We have to make sure that they are exposed to an objective. Okay? And that objective has to be performance-based in nature if you want kids to get to the proficiency finish line and beyond. And the second thing is we got to make sure that kids understand the words not only in the objective, but also in the text that they're going to be reading, no matter the grade level, no matter the content area. Number three says we got to make sure that we are constantly, gradually releasing kids to independence. Okay, And that independence does not happen overnight. It happens over over the course of a week. That's why you don't need a daily lesson plan. You need a, a lesson progression that you progress through over the course of a number of days. A lesson plan is not real. It's fictitious, y'all. And then finally, an opportunity for students to write based upon what they've read. We make teaching and learning so hard. You've been asked to do a hundred different things by a hundred different people. And here's what your superintendent and senior leadership team want. They want you to be able to focus on doing a few things well so you're not constantly overwhelmed by the demands of teaching. Are y'all with me? Somebody said, Jesus. I heard you say it. Well, I'm not proselytizing. You don't, have to, you don't have to know Jesus. You can know whoever you want to know. But, but, but call whoever helps you. Because this thing has become so complicated and it pushes us out of public air. It pushes good people out of public air. All we need to do is just figure out what works for kids. You want them to know what you want them to know and be able to do. And it's an act of instruction. It's not an act of compliance. Right now, that standard on the board is an act of compliance. You need an act of instruction through teaching them every word that lives inside of the objective. And that becomes a springboard for rigor. I'm out of time. Come on, GCPS, give it up for Dr. Danielle Dickey. Thank you. Was that wonderful? We're going to send you a survey, but just by a show of hands, do we want Dr. Danielle Dickey to come back to see us again? Another dose? He's very difficult to get. You all tell him for me, tell him. That's wonderful information. I love it because it's practical, and I would not be worth anything as a superintendent to ask you to step up to increase achievement to help children grow if we didn't put tools at your fingertips. So we knew we couldn't afford to send you all to where he was, so we thought we'd bring him here. Thank you for being here today. I'd like to also welcome to Granville County our guests from other districts. 
This is an absolutely wonderful, wonderful group. I thank all of you for your attention. We will be working with secondary educators next. So we have a few instructions this afternoon so everyone gets out safely. First and foremost, we will all exit through the left doors. They're waving their hands in the back. We have some secondary people who will be coming in and they will be using the right door. So everyone will just shift this way as we exit out of the left doors. One moment. If you'll also take your trash with you when you depart this afternoon, we would appreciate it. Up on the screen is your attendance code. We want to make certain everyone gets credit. Why don't you take a picture of it? Just in case you, you don't have time to do this right away. There will also be a side exit adjacent to me where you can depart the campus. We know we have one group coming in and another group trying to exit. So it might be wise to use the side exit adjacent to this side of the building directly behind us. I would like to thank South Bramble. I'd like to thank our academic team for joining me in thinking this was a really good way to end our school year. And finally, once again, let's thank Dr. Danielle Dickey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful afternoon.